Right, I want to talk to you today about 20 ways to prepare for hard times. Um, hard times are coming. If you haven't been aware of that or aren't seeing it, well, wake up. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you different things that I've learned over the years from a lot of years of study and, and going to third world countries and, and um, seeing some poor areas, seeing rich areas. Uh, I've, I've seen a, a lot of different things. But I've learned some things and those things I want to impart to you. And I'm going to give you 20 ways that you can prepare for hard times that are coming and are very much already here. Number one, get a King James Bible and ask for God to save you and give you wisdom. Okay? Let me show you the scriptures on that real quickly. All you got to do is get a King James Bible. They have them at dollar stores. It won't cost you that much. Very important to make sure that you have a copy of God's perfect word, the King James Bible. Um, to say this about this King James Bible, this thing was first printed in 1611. Okay, 1604, the work began, and seven years later it was finished, 1611. Uh, no other Bible out there is like that. Okay, um, the new versions uh, say, well, they're just updating. So, no, they're not. They're from a different, uh, entirely different Greek text. Um, they come from the Vatican. You can get into the whole thing, study it. But there's a reason that this book is the most printed book in the history of man. Okay, 400 plus years and it's still printed and published and people still live by this book. There's a reason for that. You would do well to read it. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 13 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, I'm not ready for this religious, I didn't tell you religion. I'm not ready to go to church, I didn't tell you that. Nobody went to church in here. Okay, the church is the people, it's not a building. And you don't have to give 10% tithe and whatever else. That stuff is all man-made. All right, read the King James Bible, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, very important to understand that God can save you. Now, you might not be ready for that. Maybe you still think that there's still hope for the future and whatever else, and you're going to hold out for a while. Um, but you're going to get to a point in time when you're going to have to call out to the Lord to save you. Okay? And there's a lot more to the thing of salvation as far as looking at the Scriptures, going through what the Bible teaches. You can watch our salvation message or some of the other sermons I've done on that issue. But you need to be saved. Make sure that you're saved. God needs to be there to protect you. Okay? So what about the thing of giving God giving you wisdom? James chapter 1. The book of James. Also a very important thing to understand here. James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If you want to have wisdom for what's coming and what's going on in the world and what you should do and whatever else, ways to prepare yourself for these hard times, um, you need to ask God. Again, go to your Creator. Don't go to the experts and whatever else and Wall Street and New York Times and whatever else and the, the, the big Fox News reports and the this and that. You need to ask God. Okay, that's the most important thing. That's why I put it number one in this list. You need to get a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He is God. All right, please understand that. Again, you can do all the research, do all the study into this thing. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. King James Bible, that's responsibility number one. Number two, you need to get out of debt. Okay, very important. Make sure that you are not in debt with what is coming to this world. Um, the whole system of borrowing money and credit and, and all this other stuff and the little paper money, funny money and things and credit cards and what it's all coming to an end. You say, what about gold and silver? That too. Okay? It's being manipulated right now. It's going to be manipulated in the future. All right? Um, but debt, if you're in debt, you are a slave. You are a servant, the Bible says. Okay, very important you understand that. You say, well, I, don't, I reject the Bible. Okay, then just think about it from a, just a logical perspective. If you owe somebody money, are you free? No. 
you are that person's servant. They own you, in a sense. Okay, well, I can go do whatever, yeah, but you're still going to have to pay that debt back. You see? You need to get out of debt. Okay, that's one of the most important things that you can do in economically hard times. Right? If you are free from debt, then you are free to go out and do what you need to do. All right? Very simple thing to think about here. If you can't afford it, then don't buy it. Save up your money. Learn to save up your money to buy those things that you need. You say, well, I can use a credit card. Then you're in debt. Well, I can get a mortgage. Then you're in debt. I can go get a car loan. Then you're in debt. And you're a servant to that person who gave you the money. Get out of debt. Point number three, learn to work with your hands. That's another thing that's very important when things get hard, hard times. You can always fall back on hand skills. Um, a lot of the old timers, you read stories about people back many years ago, they didn't just have one job. Um, farmers would work as loggers in the wintertime. Um, they could sell things and make things, they'd make furniture, they'd do blacksmithing, they'd do a lot of different things, a lot of different hand skills. Learn to use chainsaws, learn to use something like this, a building in other words. Um, can you swing a hammer? Can you use a saw? Can you uh, fix vehicles? Things like that. Learn to do things with your hands. Okay, let me show you what the Bible has to say about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. The Bible is very strong in support of you learning to work with your hands. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. And that you study to be quiet and do your, to do your own business and to work with your own hands, hmm. as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Hmm. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to say I have lack of nothing? Well, you can do that if you have skills with your hands, because you create your own job. So it doesn't matter what's going on with the economy or whatever else, unemployment and things. You have a lot of hand skills. You can cut down trees when there's storms. You can go and you can repair somebody's place with your hammer, hammer and nails. You can fix somebody's car. You can whatever. Learn to work with your hands. Very important. Number four, buy good natural fiber clothing. The Bible calls it raiment. I'll show you an example here. This is a wool coat. Very, very warm, a filson coat. You can see it up in here. Right there, you can see the filson. This coat, brand new, would be about $750. I got it used on eBay. Didn't even pay anywhere close to that. Very, very cheap. Here we have a pure wool sweater for the wintertime. Less than $5 at a Goodwill store. All right. Again, here we have the warmest type of coat that you can get for winter, a shearling coat. It's the sheep, the leather from the sheep on the outside and on the inside it's the wool. Okay, warm as you can get. This coat probably would be about a $2,000 coat. I got it really cheap on eBay. Okay, not even close to that price. I'm not going to spend $2,000 on a coat, but the whole point I'm trying to make is People have gotten away from the thing of wearing winter clothing and it just boggles my mind. I see people out in, in sub-zero temperatures here in northern Maine and they're wearing some kind of a light little thin jacket. They're, why? Well, because they're living in, a, in an artificially created environment in their home with their thermostat set at 72 degrees. So you just stay warm all the time in there. And um, then you put on your little synthetic polyester windbreaker, north face windbreaker or something and you walk out run out quick to your vehicle that you remotely started and the heater's going in there or whatever and you drive to the convenience store, quick hop out, go in and get your coffee and come back and you're getting warm that way. That's very foolish. Why? Hard times come, what are you going to do? You can't afford the oil heat in your home. You can put on a coat like this and sit in your home and have just a small little heat lamp or just a little heater down by your feet and you don't even need to warm up the room. You say, well, oh, that's ridiculous. Hard times, remember? Look at people in the past. Look at the people in the bread lines, the depression and things. They're wearing heavy coats. Most of them were wool. Big, heavy coat like that. Uh, again, understand the difference between natural fibers like cotton, 
uh, linen, wool, silk, those types of things that breathe, that are going to regulate your body temperature. And then you take the acrylics, the, the polyesters and things like that. Um, those things there are made out of plastic, oil-based. Uh, we'll put a plastic bag over you and see how, you know, it regulates your body temperature. If it doesn't, you're going to get very hot, you're going to get very sweaty. All right, uh, things that are not natural fiber, I don't wear. All right, but it's very important to understand the thing of natural fiber and, and wearing, you know, spending your money in, in areas like that. I'll show you again what the Bible says. Um, whether or not you believe in the Bible doesn't matter. Um, it's just a matter of common sense. Times get bad, you're going to need some good clothing. First Timothy chapter 6, uh, verses, let me see here, verse 8. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Um, is that the sign of somebody in hard times? Yes. Food and the clothing on your back? Be content with that. Well, if you can start out there, then, you know, other things won't seem as bad. You say, well, hey, I have some food in my stomach and, and I have some good clothing on. Again, this is a, this is a cotton shirt here. And this is a wool vest right here. And it regulates my body temperature quite nicely. I don't have to worry about going outside and well, my vehicle won't start or, or whatever else. Oh, I'm going to freeze to death now. Or i got to quick get on my cell phone or something and get help here quickly. And I'm freezing until they get... No, no. I put on my winter clothes. I can go outside. I don't even need to have heat in my vehicle. It's pretty nice. And I want you to think about something else too if you're a Christian. And that is the fact that Jesus was homeless. Son of man hath not where to lay his head. You know, he didn't have a, a home when he was out doing his ministry. And yet... The soldiers cast lots for his garments. Let me show you that. Matthew chapter 27. People had different priorities in the past. People were a lot smarter. Matthew chapter 27. Um, verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Uh, they wouldn't have done that if he was just wearing some burlap sacks or whatever else. He had fine clothing. Why? Because fine clothing keeps you warm. I'm not talking about designer brands or whatever else. I'm talking about clothing that is made very, very well. This vest right here has been with me for years. And this vest... I've taken this thing all kinds of snowshoeing and all kinds of different weather and, and things in the wintertime. Um, it's gotten wet and whatever else, and it still looks just as good as it did when it was new. All right. In fact, it wasn't actually new. I got it used. I have another one that I got new. But some of these other coats here, this thing here, it's from the 1980s, this coat here, made in Germany, and it still looks good. You can see where it's faded up here, up here on the uh, collar area. See the fading there compared to the inside? Still works. Nice uh, coat to work in. Um, your raiment is very, very important. I suggest you try out the thing of wearing natural fiber. Um, again, if you're reduced to all you have is the clothing on your back, what quality of clothing do you have? It's really something that you need to think about. Number five. Lower your dependence on technology. I didn't say you had to eliminate it or anything, but as times get rough, being dependent on technology is going to be expensive. Okay, uh, learn to do things low tech way. All right, um, very important to get away from just always having to have technology. If you're a young person, you're you don't know what it's like to live in the world without the cell phone. But I was raised, born in 1975, so. When I was a teenager, there, were, there was no such thing as cell phones, and we did just fine, okay? Um, it's an old saying, they say, don't leave home without it. Well, I would say, when it comes to technology, do leave home without it. Um, you can do just fine, and uh, you don't need technology to rule your life, okay? There's somebody coming along here. He doesn't have technology, <laughs> um, but uh, do... Do learn to, to not be as, as technology dependent. Uh, that is very, very important. As things get rough, 
Uh, you might not always be able to afford that new phone or your monthly phone bill or uh, new computers or whatever else. Um, just please think about that, okay? Point number six, ask for the old pads. Also a very important thing, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, in the King James Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old pads, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Most Americans are not interested in the old ways. They don't care about antiques, they don't care about how did people do things in the past, and that's why we're in the trouble that we're in. The old saying goes, the only thing that men learn from history is that men don't learn from history. A lot of truth to that, okay? When you ask for the old paths, you'll see that there's a lot of wisdom that has been lost. People were not as dependent as we are today. Um, again, ask for the old paths. Think about something. Uh, what are the, the basic requirements that you have in your life? You say, well, I have to have electricity, I have to have flush toilets, I have to have uh, all these different things. Um, did people have those 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago? Again, we're talking about when times get rough here. Times are good and whatever else, well, sure, you can have whatever you feel like having. You want to waste your life away doing whatever. doesn't matter. But when times get rough, ask for the old paths. When God's judgment starts to hit a nation and that nation starts to fall apart, their critical infrastructure falls apart, what do you do? You ask for the old paths. You say, what did people do in the past? How did people survive the first Great Depression? You see? You don't just say, well, you know, scared rabbit syndrome, you just kind of hunker down and you say, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. The government will take care of me. Everything will be fine. No, you don't do that. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. It's very important to remember that. Number seven, fight your phobias. Okay, a lot of people have fear of things, and, and uh, the reality of it is, they, you have to fight that stuff when times get hard. You have to break away from habit. Uh, if you're forced into doing certain things because you've always done it that way, well, maybe you need to think about some new alternatives, um, some different ways that you can save money and, and live a much better life. Um, number one, one thing that you need to, a phobia that you need to fight is the thing of thinking that you need to have a shower every day. Okay? Um, people didn't do that in the past. Uh, it's When you get right down to it, if you're putting uh, using a lot of the toxic soap and shampoo, it's actually not even good for your body. Even if you're using good ways to bathe, uh, it's still not real good to be showering and bathing every single day. And what is the point of showering and bathing every single day? You say, well, to get rid of sweat. Well, what is sweat? Sweat is toxicity that's leaving the body. Um, that's what it is. Well, if you clean up your diet and you get plenty of exercise and, and whatever else, you get your nutrition in good shape, your sweat's not going to stink as bad, meaning you don't need to shower as much. Okay, I'm not talking about going full-on Amish here and showering once or twice a, a month or something. Uh, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm just simply saying, uh, what did people do before the advent of showers? I mean, are you aware that a lot of people didn't even have showers in the 1950s living out in the country here in America? Um, people took what's called a standing shower, where you just basically take a washcloth some warm water, some little bit of soap, don't use much because it's harder to get it off, and you clean the areas that need to be cleaned. And then you take that washcloth and you rinse it off and you put clean water on there and you rinse those areas off, much like you do your hands. Okay? Not really that difficult. Another phobia that you need to fight against when hard times come is the thing of, you know, you have to wash your clothes every time you wear them. Um, fight against that. Fight the temptation to say, well, I wore this shirt and it doesn't really smell bad or anything, but I, I wore it so I have to wash it. Lower your dependence on, on things like that. Again, when times get rough, you know, times are good or whatever else, well, just do whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, if times get rough, think about it. Drive older vehicles, another point. Uh, a lot of people um, are spending a mortgage, almost a mortgage amount of money, monthly payment, equal to a mortgage, in other words, for a vehicle, an auto loan, 
and I've heard of people paying seven, eight hundred dollars and up for a you know automobile. Now that's crazy. Uh, you can, there's plenty of older vehicles out there that you can drive, and uh, they're fine. Um, yeah, they might break down or something, whatever else, but learn how to fix them. Okay. Again, what are ways that you can save money when things get really rough? You don't have to have that brand new vehicle. Okay. Another one is live tiny. A lot of people will actually take an old school bus like this thing and fix it up into a tiny home. We can't because we're in northern Maine and the ceiling height's not high enough for somebody of my size. But uh, this entire old bus in running condition, I drove, drove it around, um, it's $2,800. Okay? Um, you can buy all sorts of other things and turn, convert it into a tiny house. Again, if you're drowning with some kind of big mortgage or whatever else, um, move. Get out of that situation. Uh, you can buy relatively inexpensive land and you can park things on it or you can stay at a relative's place, get a tiny house and, and stay there. Don't be a burden on them and whatever else. But study it. Look into it. Again, I can't tell you everything to do yourself. Look into the tiny home movement. All right, you can get rid of a lot of your stuff that you have that you just simply don't need. We've gotten rid of a lot of things ourselves. We're can, still doing it. And you can live very, very affordably, in fact, debt-free, um, by going tiny. Another thing to think about. Um, another one, another good one is secondhand stores and garage sales. Again, uh, a large majority of the clothing that we wear is secondhand. I uh, don't buy everything brand new. This vest right here is a Filson vest I bought on eBay. About maybe half the price of a brand new one. Um, the whole point is, don't be ashamed to wear secondhand clothing. If you can find some good secondhand clothing stores in your area, go shop there. You might be surprised what you can find. A lot of times people will, will give away uh, really expensive clothing and you can get it for very cheap. Um, garage sales are also another good one. You can get a lot of good stuff at garage sales. You know, shop around. Especially as times get worse, you know, people are going to be willing to sell more stuff that you can use. Another one that you can do the research on for your area is eating weeds and wild foods. Okay, when I say weeds, I mean dandelion greens. Um, dandelion greens, make sure that they're not sprayed with glyphosate, Roundup in other words, but uh, dandelions are actually extremely healthy, and yet they're considered by most people to be a weed. And you can look into plantain, and you can look into yarrow, and you can look into, there's so many things out there that people consider weeds, fireweed, and there's so many medicinal uh, properties to them, and, and they're edible, and actually quite healthy. Um, wild edibles, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. I've been eating wild edibles since I was a boy. Wild raspberries, wild strawberries, wild cherries, wild, you know, you go down through the list. Um, they don't get as big as the stuff in the store, because the stuff in the store is man-made. It's, it's hybridized to get big and appeal to the customer. But uh, there's wild apples up here in northern Maine just everywhere, and almost nobody eats them. Because uh, they don't look as pretty as the stuff at the store. Genetically modified apples at the store. Um, learn about wild edibles in your area. Again, I, I read a story actually of a man who had a grandmother that was in the Holocaust. And she was in one of the death camps. And she said that uh, when the soldiers weren't looking, when the guards weren't looking, she knew what wild edibles were out there while they were out forced labor and whatever else. And she would grab some and eat them quickly while the soldiers weren't looking. And she survived. She got through those death camps where most people just look and lots of weed. I can't eat that. Learn about what God grows out in nature. Okay, that's also very important. Uh, the next two are very controversial. Uh, dumpster diving. Okay, um, don't do it illegally. But if there's an area there that they don't mind you going through the dumpster or whatever else, um, I'm not talking about just throwing out garbage as in food waste and whatever else, but there's a whole lot you can look into on dumpster diving. Um, I had an older brother that used to do that when they lived in uh, northern Montana, and people would actually take things that they just didn't want, and they didn't want to take it to a secondhand store, and they would just take it down, and they'd put it near the dumpster. And uh, again, most people had too much pride to get down and say, that old chair is actually in nice shape. It doesn't smell bad. It doesn't. It's not stained. They still have a chair. If, last time I talked to him, 
that they got from a dumpster, sitting beside the dumpster. Um, again, look into that whole thing. Uh, times get bad, you see? You can get a lot of stuff. I know down in New Hampshire, I've heard actually that they'll act they actually have a little uh, place beside the dumpsters, the town dumpsters, where people can bring and put free things there, things that they don't want anymore that they would have thrown into the dumpster, but somebody else might be able to use it. Some really neat ideas with that. Um, toilet paper alternatives. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about where you live, but where I live, the toilet paper has been cleaned out of the stores because of the panic created by television. And so what do you do about toilet paper if you, if you need some and there's none available at the store? Well, uh, when I was in Central America, they actually had uh, a stipulation that many of the places where we went and stayed, even at a little uh, resort town, um, it was right along the Caribbean, and uh, they actually said, do not put the toilet paper into the toilet and flush it because the septic system here can't handle it. And, um, and so you had to, when you were done, you had to put it in a trash can beside the toilet. And then the, the hotel staff would come and, and remove it, you know, every day or whatever else when you weren't in there. And, um, you know, again, a lot of the stuff is just facts of life in other countries. It just, we take it for granted that there's always going to be toilet paper on the shelf. Uh, but uh, look at the toilet paper alternatives. Okay, you can take a wet paper towel and not soaking wet, but a damp paper towel. And it's bigger and it's stronger. So you can use part of it, fold it. Use another part of it and fold it. You can do that maybe three or four times um, instead of using, you know, that many pieces of toilet paper. Um, I've known people, uh, ex-military types and whatever else, that are into survivalism type of things, and they'll go on these backpacking adventures, and they'll use a cloth, a piece of cotton, an old T-shirt or whatever else, and you do your business, and when you're done, wash it off in the stream. Let it dry. You say, oh, that's terrible then go without toilet paper. You know what I'm saying? Number eight, stop going out to eat for any reason. A lot of people are probably going to disagree with me on this one and say, well, there's times it's okay and whatever. Remember, we're talking about when things get hard, when times get rough. Um, you would do well to just stay away from any kind of restaurant or thing like that. Again, my opinion, you, don't, you can take it or leave it, whatever. I'm just giving you some advice. A lot of people say, how do I get out of debt? Well, a good way is to make your food yourself, okay? If you have a special occasion, a birthday or anniversary or something like that, then buy special food. That way you get the tip, the one that makes it, okay? The thank you from the, the loved one that you're making it for. Um, again, you can go out and you can, you can spend a night on the town or whatever else, and oh, we're going to have a good time going out to eat. You can have a really good time staying at home and cooking, okay? Making a, a special recipe or whatever else. Uh, again, get some, some paper-based recipe books and um, make something special. That's what people did in the past. This thing of we got to go out to eat and whatever else. Uh, you know, I worked in restaurants for a few years as a teenager. Uh, I see the kind of stuff that uh, goes on there. And I've worked in all variety of restaurants out there. I've worked in the uh, low-end kind of, not fast food, but like a diner type of a thing, you know, Hot dogs, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, whatever, fried chicken type of a thing. Strasburg Railroad dining car restaurant was what it was called. Um, they had a classy dining you know, experience on the train itself. I worked as a cook in that. And I also worked at a very expensive sort of a five-star you know, eatery type of place with filet mignon and the French cuisine and all the other stuff. I've worked in the, a lot of different types of restaurants there, in other words. And none of them were real clean okay so uh you say well we're trying to save money okay stop going out to eat and especially avoid the fast food fast food is real bad okay if you want to be able to save money on food uh, there's a lot of different things that you can get that are cheap very low cost again depression era cooking people ate a lot of oatmeal people would eat a lot of pasta depending on where they were at the the availability of those things and, and how cheap they were or whatever but people learned to to pinch pennies so to speak they they learned to um eat low cost okay um 
potatoes when we first moved to Maine. Northern Maine is a big potato growing area and um, you can get potatoes for very, very cheap. Um, you, can, you can buy potatoes and uh, you know, live very, very affordably. Um, so, uh, in case you're wondering, that's my wife riding by on our, a snowmobile that we bought. And um, it's the only way back into the property here, so northern Maine, what, do you, what can I say? <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing of going out to eat, that's another thing that you can cut out when times get rough and you can say, hey, I don't want to, you know, spend the money going out there. We'll buy inexpensive food or special food for special occasions. Save yourself a lot of money doing that. Number nine, find hidden sources of income. Uh, a lot of different ways that you can do that. One thing that you can do is scrap metal. Okay, there's always somebody out there throwing away some kind of a big metal appliance or whatever else. And I've met a lot of guys that actually make their living with scrap metal. A lot of work, but you can actually do okay with it. You have magnetic and non-magnetic materials and things, of course. And the, the market will fluctuate between, you know, what is steel worth today, what is steel worth tomorrow. Uh, the big metal... The most uh, valuable metal in scrap in the scrap world is going to be copper, and there's a lot of different ways that you can find copper. Okay, one of those ways actually is right here. See, it looks like an old heater. It is. It doesn't work anymore. You say, well, then just take it out and put it out to the trash and throw it away. Uh, hold on. This wire right here that doesn't work in this appliance anymore. There's pure copper wire in this. 0.999 copper wire okay and I had a buddy that worked at a hardware store for a while and they people bring in old appliances and, and they would just they would call it a policy a and they'd write it off on their taxes or whatever and then they would take the thing out back and throw it in the dumpster and he got into the habit of just having an old pair of wire cutters and he would just go chop the wire off for me and he'd bring me a whole box of, of scrap wire like this uh, it's great this is one of my heaters I used to have down in our basement and it stopped working. Tried to fix it and whatever else and it does not work anymore. So I'm going to take this thing apart. There are screws in this thing, like that one, that can be taken apart, added to my collection of screws. Um, and that copper wire. And you take this, the copper you know, out of this, this plastic casing off of there, the copper wire is worth a pretty good amount of money. Um, it's worth, I think, right around two, just under three dollars or something right now. But that can go up quite a bit um, and the point is it doesn't cost you anything instead of throwing this out and letting it go to some landfill someplace scrap the copper wire it's free income it's a little bit of your time another thing that you can do that is also something that is just there and most people don't understand it is right here this versus that you say, well, they're two pennies, aren't they? To the uninitiated. Okay, if you don't know about coins, um, that's why I'm saying uninitiated. It doesn't have anything to do with the occult. But um, this one here is a 1978. This one is a 2015. You say, what's the difference? This one's almost pure copper. This one is just almost copper paint over top of zinc, if I remember correctly. These are not worth very much money. 1982 and older pennies are worth actually more than their face value. Again, well, it's, you're not going to make a huge amount of money. Well, if things get really, really rough, something like this is smart to do. And if you get pennies in your in your change, why not just separate out the older pennies? You see, uh, these older ones are worth more money. Again, you're dealing with copper. And if the economy totally falls apart and America totally crumbles as a nation, wouldn't you like to have a bunch of copper pennies around? Copper is always going to be worth something. It is a semi-precious metal. And it doesn't cost you anything to collect pre-1982 pennies. 1982, they changed, by the way. About halfway through the year or so, they started to make the pennies this way with the zinc. Um, so these weigh just over 3 grams, and these weigh like 2.5 grams, if I remember correctly. If you have a little gram scale, you can tell the difference. Okay, So 1982, it did transition there from pure copper, nearly pure copper, to this over here. 
Another thing that you can do is look for um, 1964 or older dimes and quarters. Now there's very few in circulation anymore, but you might find one. I went to a post office the one time and I got change and it included a dime and I was walking out, looked down at my hands and there's this dime and I thought, that's weird. Didn't even register in my mind, you know, until just a few minutes later I thought, wait a second, that's a mercury dime from the early 1900s. That dime at the time was worth just about two dollars. Um, so uh, it's silver, 90% silver. So um, if you can find a quarter or a dime that is older than 1964, again, if you get it in your change, you're doing really good. Half dollars and things too, you can get into some of that stuff. Look up the thing of uh, coins of different value. Another way that just keep an eye out and you can make some money. And there are coin collectors, by the way, that will pay extra for a good roll of pre-1982 copper pennies if things get rough. Remember, another thing that you can do is eBay and Etsy. Um, you can make things and sell things on eBay or Etsy. Again, I have done that over the years, sold things on eBay. Haven't done Etsy yet. We have an account, but uh, there's a lot of things that you can do if you can make things with your hands. Again, listening to what I've been saying, buy tools. If you're a woman, buy knitting needles, crochet hooks, uh, get into other types of things, uh, uh, whatever, and um, you can sell that stuff on Etsy. Um, it's more of a you know, place to sell artwork and whatever else, uh, things that you make with your hands. Um, firewood, another thing that you can do that I've done over the years. Um, you can, if you have the land, uh, you can saw and split firewood, and you can sell it and get decent money for it. Um, years ago I used to do it and it was about hundred and thirty dollars a cord and I could do a quarter a day so one hundred thirty dollars a day and there's no tax on it or anything else you just put an ad in the paper people come they buy the firewood uh, make sure it's seasoned well it's you know sawed and split in the spring and you sell it in the fall in other words it's had all summer to dry out don't sell them green firewood just freshly cut unless they know that and then you get less money for it but that's another way that you can make money when things get bad. Okay. Another thing that you can do is deconstruction. Uh, again, I've done that, um, where people will have an old wooden deck on their property, or, or some people even get into the thing of deconstructing old houses uh, or whatever, and you can get a lot of good building material out of that. And um, I mean, there's there's people on YouTube I've seen that literally will build tiny houses or whatever else from old. Uh, houses that were torn down, old barns that were torn down. You can get on Craigslist a lot of times and, and look in America here, Craigslist, and you can look and, and see, you know, free barn lumber or free windows or free whatever. And you can, you know, amass quite a good supply of building materials and build your own things from deconstruction. Very interesting. Another thing that you can do when things get bad is barter, trade things. Again, if you have skills, the more skills that you can develop, the more you can make things with your hands and be able to trade them. Uh, look at the Great Depression. People that had a lot of different skills survived. The people in the cities that worked for Wall Street or whatever else, they were the ones that were jumping off the buildings and splattering on the pavement. Sorry to be graphic, but that's what they did. You can look that up. I'm not joking. Uh, why? Well, because they, only, they had all their eggs in one basket, as the old saying goes. They only had one skill. And that was, you know, uh, finance and, and accounting and, or, or, you know, working in the finance world, be it investments or whatever else. And so when the stock market crashed, they had nothing else to do. They lost everything, and so they just figured that they would end their life. Terrible, terrible tragedy. But the more skills that you can develop, the more you can trade those skills for things. And um, I imagine... You know, as this country becomes a third world country, because America's not in Bible prophecy, so I don't think America's going to come out of this economic crash that's coming. Um, you might have to rely on a lot of different things and barter. Number 10, self-defense. What better place to talk about self-defense than in an old ambulance? <laughs> I'm odd, I know. Um, three things I want to talk about. Three A's, okay? Attitude, awareness, and avoid danger, all right? Um, as things get hard, as times get rough, people, when they're losing everything, they're gonna 
lose their minds. Okay, and it's uh, very important to prepare yourself mentally for the kinds of things that you might see. Uh, Seven million people died of malnutrition as a result of the first Great Depression, and that's back when people were rate, you know, had their own food and garden and the whole deal. People are a lot more dependent now. Okay, uh, it's it's going to be a bad situation. You have people that are on pharmaceutical drugs. They might not be getting their drugs. They're going to be going into withdrawal. There's a whole lot of stuff, and America has become a much more godless nation since, you know, in the last hundred years, essentially. Not quite 100 years since the first Great Depression. But uh, as times get hard, people are going to start getting desperate. And that's why you have to think about self-defense. And I'm not, I know that there are people out there that can't get guns, firearms. Uh, you, a lot of my viewers can't. I get that. Um, but you have to to mentally prepare yourself. Luke chapter 22, Jesus said to sell your garment and buy a sword. The Lord and the Bible is not against self-defense. It's against aggression, wars of aggression, where you're going out and spreading Christianity with the sword. Totally wrong. But uh, defending yourself, that's another issue entirely. As people get desperate, you might be called into a situation where you will have a violent confrontation with somebody. Okay, so the first thing is attitude. You're not looking for a fight. You're a Christian. You are conscious of people needing to be saved, people going to heaven or hell. And so you're going to want to uh, avoid that um, as far as uh, avoid having to hurt somebody. Okay, but your attitude has to be, hey, I'm not going to let that person take what I have um, if they're not working for it or whatever else, or they're not coming up and saying, could you help me? That's different. All right. Um, and it's not about being materialistic or holding on to your possessions or whatever. It's talking about, you know, we're talking here about thieves and robbers. Um, you know, you have to have that attitude there. Okay. If, if people come and they say, uh, you know, I, I'd like to have some food or whatever else, are you willing to work for it? Don't just say, oh, sure, here you go. Um, Christians, another big mistake that Christians make is they help people who are under God's judgment. Okay, many years ago there was a big uh, earthquake, I think it was, it hit Haiti. And I had a brother tell me, he said, oh man, isn't that terrible? And I said, not really, because I said that country uh, dedicated themselves to Satan. The president of the country dedicated the nation to Satan uh, not long before that happened. So they were under God's judgment. And people right away are, oh, let's send them aid, let's go, let's go help them. Careful. Be careful with that, okay? Your attitude should be one that, yes, I want to help people. I don't want to fight. But if you come and you try to take what I have to provide for my family, there's going to be a problem. And I will have to use force and deadly force if necessary. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I do have a study on self-defense and the Bible. What does the Bible teach about that? If you want more information, more scripture on that. Number two, you need awareness, okay? Um... Awareness is just simply you need to wake up to the reality that is coming to this world. As times get bad, you need to say, okay, uh, the prescription drug thing, there's people that are on opioids. I'm seeing more people acting like zombies even right now. I'm not joking. Seeing people swerving into other lanes with their vehicles, speeding up, slowing down, and they're just... And you see them at the store and you say, hi, how are you doing? And they just... They just kind of shuffle by and you think, whoa, older people, younger people, doesn't matter. Your awareness needs to come up to a level where you say, hey, you know what? My life could be in danger. The, the lives of my wife and my children could be in danger. I better make sure that I'm praying, Lord, please keep us safe. Um, and, you know, the third point here, I need to get into this, avoid danger. Okay, first you need to have the attitude. People aren't going to hurt me, right, for just whatever there. <laughs> if you're witnessing and they're attacking you, okay, that's what the Bible says will happen. But if you're just, they're attacking you and, you know, for no good reason, well, you know, just other than they're losing their mind or whatever else, you need to defend yourself. Number two, you need to be aware there of the danger that does exist when a country starts to fall apart. Number three, avoid that danger. Don't go to the ghettos. Uh, don't go to places where you know, 
hey, there could be some problems down here. As the economy falls apart, as times get rough, avoid those bad places. Okay? Um, you say, well, I'm armed to the teeth. I can, I can uh, go anywhere I want to go. Uh, well, you're foolish. Okay? You can be armed to the teeth and still get shot in the back. All right? Uh, avoid danger as much as possible. All right? Again, I'm, I'm talking about your normal day-to-day -day life. If the Lord calls you to go witness to somebody, somebody wants to hear the gospel and says, hey, you know, I, I have a brother that's it's whatever. Could you please come down and, and witness to him? Okay. Pray about it. Lord sends you down there, whatever, that's fine. I'm not talking about the Christian walk here as far as witnessing, preaching the gospel. I'm talking about your normal life, going to the grocery store. Don't go in the middle of the night, okay, to a bad part of town to get your groceries. All right, as times get worse, you have to wake up, all right? <laughs> very, very important to do that. And if you don't, well, you might end up in a place like this with the uh, sirens on and heading for the hospital. Think about that. Number 11, invest in non-electric tools. Another thing is very important. There's a whole lot of tools out there that you can get, be they wrenches or hammers or saws or all kinds of different things that uh, they don't require any electricity and they're pretty cheap to purchase and you can do a lot with them. In a very short amount of time you can get a little toolbox like this and you can fill it up with all kinds of different things that you might need. Let me show you real quickly. Here you have a, a screwdriver with little bits that you can change in the, the end there. And you have all different types of little, uh, little bits that will go at the end of the thing. You have a little miniature level there. Um, utility knives for cutting up boxes or whatever you want, uh, some electrical tape, you know, start slow. You can start to build up into all this different stuff. We have uh, vice grips, very important. You can do a lot with these types of things. Um, needle nose pliers, and uh, I mean, just so many different things. Adjustable wrench here, like in a crescent type of wrench there. You can have these uh, wire cutters here, these snips. They'll cut all kinds of different things metal-wise. Point is, um, when times are really hard, you might need to do a bunch of different things for an, an income. And the best thing to do is to invest your money wisely. Don't put your money into the bank and expect that you're going to get interest or whatever else. Invest in tools, invest in things that you can use to fix up your own home and to help other people and, and whatever else. It's a good investment. If you're young especially, make sure to invest, at least get a small little toolbox and get some basic tools and learn how to do things with your hands. Okay, that's very, very important. Number 12, avoid bad advice and counsel. Um, very true on YouTube. Okay, there's a lot of YouTubers out there that you would do well to stay away from. I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking secular advice on, you know, it's time to get really rough. Um, Fox News and television and whatever else. If you haven't figured out to avoid television yet, well then, God help you. Um, but I'm going to read to you from the Bible, what the Bible says about bad advice and counsel. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, it says here, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You can prosper even when times are bad, if you have the right counsel. Verse 4, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Um, God preserved a lot of Christians through the first Great Depression. And as times get hard, God can preserve you. If you follow his word, your delight is in the law of the Lord, and you meditate on this book day and night, if you do that, and also if you listen to the right kind of advice, um, People tell you that things are going to be fine, things are getting better. What does the Bible say? 
Okay, we're going to come back to a gold standard. No, we're not. The Bible doesn't say that. Well, we're going to restore the republic. No, we're not. The Bible doesn't say that. Okay, somebody tells you that we're going to have a second American revolution and we're going to bring back this country to the way it once was. You're dealing with somebody that's living in an opium poppy dream. You know, they're, they're, it's not going to happen. Okay, uh, the Bible doesn't say those things. The Antichrist is going to, to appear. The body Christ is going to be leaving before then. The Antichrist appears after we're gone and then it gets real bad. Okay, so uh, how long is it from now till then? I don't know. But uh, the financial systems of the world have to collapse before the mark of the beast can be ushered in, before a one-world cashless uh, system can come in. It's just as simple as that. And so you hear somebody in there saying, we're going to return to good times. I think we're going to restore the republic and all this other stuff. Get away from them. Number 13, learn to walk places. Uh, walking is free transportation. Okay, again, all you have to have a car, you have to have public transit and all this other stuff. No, actually, you should learn to walk. All right, uh, we do a lot of walking. It's good for your health. Um, what can I say? Times get rough, you can walk most places. I uh, had a property at one point in time, we were building on this property, and, and uh, one place where the, our property started a half mile off the road, and I'd carry materials back in on my back. And uh, the neighbor just thought I was crazy, he thought I was nuts in the head because I would walk a half mile. Uh, no, he's the one that's crazy that has to drive everywhere he goes. I have to go down to the store just a little bit down the road or whatever. I got to get my truck and go down. Learn to walk, okay? Walking is very, very important and it's free. Come on, son. Number 14, read paper-based books. Very important. There's a wealth of information out there that's available to you, and uh, it's right here. Um, all kinds of different books on all, a lot of different subjects and everything else. You can learn about almost anything uh, from paper-based books, and they work. Every time the power goes out, they don't require anything. You can pick up a lot of these types of books for a dollar or two if you go to used bookstores. You can collect a lot of information, a lot of wealth of knowledge from these books. And you can read them right up until the time you go to bed. You can even read them in bed and they won't mess up your ability to sleep. They're not a blue screen like a Kindle or something like that. They always work. So uh, times get hard and times get rough. Fall back and to reading paper-based books for your entertainment and to educate yourself further so that you can have more skills. Um, to be able to make more money uh, for those hard times. Number 15, get proper rest. Also is a thing that a lot of people don't uh, think about. In hard times you want to make sure that you have proper rest. The three most important things when it comes to your health. Proper nutrition, eat the right foods as close to nature as possible. Proper nutrition, proper rest, proper exercise. If you do those things you'll be in good shape. Okay. But you say, well, I have a hard time getting to sleep at night. Okay, very simple formula. Um, about 9.30 to 10 o'clock in there, uh, I want you to just shut off computers. No computers, no cell phone, no television, no screen time. Okay, get away from screens. The blue light that they put off and everything else makes your brain stay awake. Get away from that stuff. Now, what you can do is you can write first or read first. And when I say read, I don't mean Kindle. That's a screen again. You can read a paper-based book. It's a good suggestion there. But there are other ones as well that you can read. Something like that. Mountain Man Crafts and Skills or you pick it. Whatever you want. A paper-based book. Read it. And then for a half hour and then write for a half hour. Okay? Or you can say 15 minutes or something of, of each or whatever and then go to bed. And in about a week, you'll be getting very, very deep sleep. Uh, if you have insomnia and things like that, I've seen this thing work with a lot of people. It worked with me. Uh, used to be I'd have a terrible time of sleeping, and I sleep great now, for the most part. Um, you need to have proper rest when times get hard. All right, very, very important. 
Number 16, be your own doctor. Also very important. Uh, again, another appropriate video here in this old ambulance. Um, these types of things here, there's a lot of the medical establishment and things, um, the, the critical treatment of an accident victim or whatever else, there is some, I guess, wisdom to some of that stuff. Trauma, in other words. But uh, a lot of the things that people get taken to the hospital for is you shouldn't be going to the hospital. And the whole point is, as times get rough, as times get hard, you need to be your own doctor. When you get sick, start to research, start to study. All right, uh, what are the things that um, I need to do to make myself better? What is the nutrition that I need to, to um, partake in? You know, what are, what are the things I should be eating? Am I getting enough exercise? Am I getting enough rest? Um, can I pray about this? Do pray about it when you get sick. Those are very important, but you need to be your own doctor, right? Um, if things get real super bad, there aren't going to be enough of these to be going around picking up people, all right? Uh, it could get really traumatic. And again, we're not hoping for any of this type of stuff, but as Bible-believing Christians, we understand that there's wars and rumors of wars. There's times get worse. Um, as we get closer to the catching up of the body of Christ. And uh, it's so important that you get yourself into good health. Um, and, you know, the whole... I just got to say some things about the medical establishment, and that is there's, there's so many things that we've been studying, my wife and myself have been studying about the medical establishment that are so backward. They do things so ridiculous. Um, just to give you an example, blood pressure. Okay? Okay. Um, for years, I was told I had high blood pressure. Come to find out, no, I don't. Uh, the Joint National Committee actually changed blood pr pressure standards back a few years ago, and the doctors are still saying 120 over 80 for your blood pressure. And you can be in an accident, and they put you on the gurney or whatever, stick you in here, roll you in the back doors there, put you in here on the gurney, and they what do they do? They take your blood pressure. As you're going screaming down the road, sirens blaring, heading to the hospital, and they're taking your blood pressure. Oh, it's up. Well, of course it's going to be up. You know, and, and again, look into some of the stuff on blood pressure, uh, how that the, the numbers have been changed. I think it's 140 over 80 now for people over 60 or over. And um, old time doctors used to say back in the early 1900s, they would say it's, it's 100 plus your age for the high number. Again, there's so much that goes on. Why did your blood pressure go up? You know, I could, I mean, I could talk for a while on this. It's something that my wife and I are very passionate about. The whole pharmaceutical industry and whatever else, it's a big drug dealing business, is what it is. And you go into those places, they will make you sick. You say, well, I don't believe that, okay? Simple thing to think about. If you're on prescription drugs, are those drugs making you better or sicker? You say, well, they're making me better. I have to be on them. They're, they're, they're my drugs. They're my prescribed uh, medicine. <laughs> okay, what happens if I take your drugs? Would I get better, healthier, or would I get sicker? You say, well, you'd get sicker because it's not your prescription. Okay, um, think about that for a minute. If I tell you that eating vegetables or fruit or some good you know, superfood or some herb or whatever else, if I tell you that you can, that this is helping me to feel better, and you eat some of that, whatever I'm saying that, that, that is healing me, if you eat some, is it going to make you better or sicker? It's going to make you better. So natural health, it makes you, you know, better. It, it, it cures you, okay? Pharmaceutical drugs make you sicker. I mean, when did you ever hear of somebody saying, here, take these pharmaceutical pills and it's going to take away your diabetes, it's going to take away your high blood pressure, whatever. You shouldn't have to be on this very long and you'll be better and everything is going to be fine. No. Symptoms management is all that they can do. little rant here, but the whole point I'm trying to make is, as times get rougher, you might not be able to get those pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, 80 to 90% of pharmaceutical drugs are made in China. Um, I mean, they... they you might start seeing the, I mean, the toilet paper's already gone. 
from the store shelves. It's around here, probably in your area as well. People are panic buying. What about pharmaceutical drugs? China's not going to ship this stuff over to America. What about the pharmaceutical drugs that they make? You could start seeing shortages literally before I even get this video out. I don't know. What are you going to do if you can't get your drugs? Times get hard, you need to be your own doctor. You need to look up natural cures for your high blood pressure, for your diabetes, for your whatever you have. Don't come to me and say, hey, Brian, what do you do for your health? I'm going to do the exact same thing for my health. No, you need to be your own doctor. And the Lord Jesus Christ can heal you. He can keep you in good health. All right, but don't just say, oh, I'm just going to live wickedly and, and, and not get proper sleep and not eat the right foods and, and I'm not going to exercise and I'm just going to pray whenever I get sick, Lord, please heal me. The Lord made the natural world and he made you to work with your hands and labor and exercise and sweat and he made you to get good sleep and if you don't follow that, he's not going to just heal you just like that. Okay? You need to be your own doctor. That's very, very important. Number 17. Avoid banking as much as possible. The volatility of banks right now is going to be very, very bad. They're already bailing out the banks. They're already injecting, the Federal Reserve is already injecting all kinds of money into the economy. Having your money all in the bank is a bad idea. Okay, very bad idea at this point in time. Um, again, I think it is a wise thing and, and prudent to only keep what you need in the, in the bank to pay bills and whatever else. Banking is not a safe place to keep your money. You can look into any country that has fallen, um, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, over in India. I know that there's different places where the, the banks literally just close their doors and say, you can't get any money out. And the people say, but I need food. And they say, sorry, we don't care. Um, you can watch my study on the thing of why debtors will take the mark of the beast if you want to know more about banking. But uh, I would be real careful about keeping money in the bank. All right. Um, and if you have a safety deposit box, get that thing out of there. Get your valuables out of there as quickly as possible. They could confiscate that stuff. Um, avoid banking as much as possible. I do know of brethren that actually don't even do banking. Um, they pay with cash and things. It's a wise, wise thing to do. You're limited in some ways. I realize that. Um, but uh, all in all, it's probably... A pretty smart thing to do but my whole point is times get rough uh, you want to stay away from the banks as much as possible and if you can totally eliminate it you're even better off number 18 live as close to nature as possible right now I'm standing on land that the Lord gave us years ago uh, not very glamorous there's no house on the land here or anything at least not yet but uh, it was very low cost again Times get rough. Start thinking low cost. Start thinking, what can, sacrifices can I make? Um, the closer you get to nature, the more you learn about God's creation and, and what God provides for food, wild edibles and things. You can raise your own, grow your own, find your own food. Uh, you're going to be a lot better off. There were a lot of people in the first Great Depression. I literally heard of a story of a young, she was a young girl at the time the Depression happened. She didn't even know what happened. She said her family just does just business as usual, you know, and uh, they didn't even know what it was like to starve in that time. Um, the closer you can get to being out in God's creation, it's not it's not expensive to live out here, by the way. It's a lot cheaper than living in town, a whole lot cheaper. People in town think, it, oh, you have to be rich to live out in the country. No, you don't. Um, you, you need to learn to do things the old way. And... Uh, as I've said in other points. <clears throat> but um, living as close to nature as possible, oxygen right now is not a problem. Okay, I'm not worried about air pollution right now. Plenty of trees around here that are uh, making the air very, very fresh and smells great out here. and No electrical fields around or anything else. Uh, there's no electricity uh, on our property other than solar power. But uh, live as close to nature as possible. That's going to also be very, very important. Put you in a much stronger relationship with the Lord. Um, I can testify to that. Number 19. Learn navigation without GPS. Learn how to drive places using maps. 
Learn how to walk places using maps. Uh, learn an area, okay? Um, the Lord blessed me with being raised in the country. And uh, from the time I was a little boy, I would go out and explore the woods by myself and um, gave me a really keen sense of direction. I don't even have to look at a compass most times and I can tell if I'm heading north or east or west or south. And uh, it's been a great blessing. Driving, on the other hand, driving big trips in a vehicle, that's a lot more difficult uh, for me. I'm not very good at, at uh, navigation. Thankfully, my wife is. Uh, she's a great help with that. And we drive places and whatever else. And I can say to her, um, you know, where do I take the exit here or where do I turn there or whatever else. And she has it all printed out and, and uh, gets me where I need to go. So another thing that's very important there. Again, times get rough. Times get hard. Uh, things get really bad in your area. Can you get out of there if the Internet's down? If uh, your GPS system does not work anymore? Um, are you dependent on computers and technology and whatever else? Um, I would suggest that you start to learn to navigate, to go places. And, and uh, I mean, you don't have to become a fanatic about it or anything, you know. Uh, get compasses and all kinds of you know stuff. Compasses are cheap. I mean, you can get one. But my point I'm trying to make is learn to get around without having to rely on computers and GPS systems. Um, just the thing of when we moved to Maine years ago, uh, I did use a GPS early on, and the stupid thing got us lost a couple times. And finally, my wife was just stressed out about it, and she said, those things are stupid. I never was for it. You know, can I just please print out the instructions and I'll tell you where to turn and whatever else, I'll be your navigator. I said, well, yeah, we'll try it. And it was a lot less stressful, you know, with the, you know, her navigating. So it's a, it's something that you don't think about very much, but it's, it is an important thing to be able to read a map and to be able to know how to get places and whatever else. Another very important skill to learn. And finally, number 20, Develop Great Depression thinking. Okay, there was an old saying in the Great Depression era called use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Um, a lot of truth in that. You see here behind me, you say it looks like a bunch of junk. Well, actually this is from the Depression era. Right here behind me, this little, all these little cabinets have things in them that my grandfather would keep. You can see some old cut nails there old bolts, old screws, old all kinds of old things. My grandfather went through the Great Depression. He was born in 1910, so he was a young man when the Great Depression was in full swing. And he learned that you keep things like this. And I can't tell you how many times these little drawers here have saved me uh, from going to the hardware store or whatever. Um, there's so much that you can do uh, on your own if you just try. And you have to get into that mindset of saying, you know what, I don't, I'm not going to call up somebody to, to solve all my problems for me. I'm going to try to learn to fix this myself. And if I have something that's old that breaks down, take the bolts out of it. Take the nuts out of it. The, the screws, the copper wire, like I said earlier. Um, very important to get into that mindset. It doesn't mean you have to be a pack rat and be a you know, hoard junk or whatever else. No, just be smart with it. Um, fix things. When times get hard, that's going to be very, very important for you. If you're a young couple looking to get married or you are married or whatever else, learn to do a lot of things yourself. Okay? I pray you take heed to what I said in this video because there are hard times on the way. Uh, if the Lord, if we're still going to be here for a while and the catching up doesn't happen, well, we're going to see some really hard times. We already are. It's already happening. Um, so, just some advice from a uh, guy that's been studying this thing for a long time take it or leave it whatever you want um, I'm not going to disfellowship it with anybody if you don't uh, agree with the video or something whatever just some advice so that's going to be it thank you for watching